I want to call your attention to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. I want to ask you to hear with me, beginning at verse 28 and reading through verse 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right. You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. Show me your word. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Lord God, help us in this preaching moment, in this hearing and receiving moment, to be receptive to the Holy Spirit, to be receptive to where God is leading us and calling us and what God is doing in us and through us and to us by his power. We surrender to you today, Lord. We surrender our hearts, our minds, our anxiety, our worry, our things at home, our places to go, uh, our checklist, our, all of those things. We surrender to you today, Lord. And we come and ask you to fill us, Lord. Let the word that I speak and the preaching that goes forth bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, I'll be so very careful to give your name the praise, honor, and glory. And the people of God said, amen. Amen. I want to thank the ushers for their labor. Seven days ago, seven days ago, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Some folk done run out of Easter already. I, I, I mean, in these last seven days, the world has kicked you around, drugged you through some situations, and all your Easter joy has dissipated. But seven days after the resurrection, Jesus was walking around the streets of Jerusalem and Galilee and Bethany and Judea, and he was teaching and preaching and healing and letting people know that the world would never be the same again. No matter what you went back to, no matter what's happened in your life since last Sunday, your life can never be the same if you believe in the resurrection. If you believe that God has changed everything, your life can never be the same because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, and it is proof then that you can live a different life that you can live a life of hope, you can live a life of joy, you can live a life that's deeply rooted in who God is in your life. Jesus is the one who's made all of the difference for us. And we've been spending so much time talking about living an all-in kind of life so that in every area of your life, you're going to go all in. And here's someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of all? What's most important? What has the greatest value? And Jesus doesn't come up with something new or fancy. He turns back to the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and he says, The first thing is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what's most important here. Now, let me teach for just a moment. By the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders had 613 religious laws that people were expected to follow. 358 were negative, things you could not do. 
255 were positive things that you were to do. We can't even quote the Ten Commandments. What would happen if we had 613 that we had to think about? So in order to help people learn how to navigate, uh, the Pharisees taught them some of the commandments are more important than other commandments. And so you just wanted to make sure that you followed the weightier commandments. And so in some way they come to Jesus. He says, you've answered these people well about the questions they've asked you. But tell me, what's the most important, the most significant thing that God wants from you, that God wants from me? You ever have folk that ask you a question and you know they really don't care about your answer? You ever try to live for Jesus, and people will talk to you about God, but all they want to do is fuss about it? All they want to do is destroy your faith and and, and dissipate your confidence in God? That's really what's happening here in the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel. If you had just an opportunity to go back and read it, it starts off with Jesus telling a parable about a man who who owned property, and, and he planted his vineyard and dug a well and put a watchtower, and it was wonderful, and he planted the best fruit, and then he leased it out to someone and said, take care of it. And when it was time for the harvest to come in and to be sold, he said, I will send my servant to get my part of what's been harvested. If you read that early part of that, it says, and when he sent the servant, they beat the servant and sent the servant back. He says, well, I'll send another servant. Maybe that was a mistake. They didn't really know. They beat him even more severely. He sent a third servant, and they killed the third servant. And then he says, you know, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send my own son. Surely when, when they see my son, they, they'll respond and they'll do that. But if you read the text very carefully, it says when they saw the son, they said, oh, the son is the heir. If we kill the son, we'll own it. He'll own it all. Then Jesus looked at the religious folk, that'd be us. He says, you do remember the text that says the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then just at that point, it says the church folk got mad at Jesus because they recognized that he was talking about them. That Jesus comes to us over and over again, only asking for what he's given us stewardship of only asking us to respond to him with the joy he's already given us, only asking us to respond to him with the praise and, 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 and just the, 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 the sense of who God is in our lives. But when Jesus comes, we turn him away over and over and over and over again. And now he sent his only begotten son. And what do we do with Jesus day after day in our lives? And then Jesus is there, and they keep testing Jesus. They they, they come to him and say, Jesus, is it right that we should pay taxes to Caesar? Because they thought they had him. No matter what he says, we got him. If he stands up in front of these folk, and he says we are not to pay taxes to Caesar, we're going to run tail Caesar. Because that would be sedition. That would be treason. But if he says, yes, you ought to pay the taxes, then we're going to lift him up before the people and say, oh, he's in cahoots with the Roman government who are your oppressors. This man isn't for you. You remember what Jesus said to him? Jesus says, show me a coin. Oh, y'all, let me teach you a minute. These are religious folk who by that same law that they followed were to have no graven images. When Jesus said, show me the money, they reached in their pocket. If you're that holy, why you got a picture in your pocket of Caesar? Somebody going to get this. Jesus says, show me the coin. They didn't have to go to the bank and get it. They had it on them. Then Jesus looks at them and says, oh, whose face is on this coin? They looked and said, Caesar, Tiberius, that, that's the face. Then Jesus looked at them and said, well, give Caesar everything that belongs to Caesar. Everything that you think belongs to Caesar, give it to him. 
But then he answered the question they didn't ask. But give God everything that belongs to God. Give God everything that belongs to God. He left that question with you and with me to ask ourselves, what belongs to God? What belongs to God? Now, the easy, quick answer is everything. If it's everything, why do we keep hiding it from it? If everything belongs to God, my joy, my praise, my happiness, my peace, my life, my children, my home, my car, my everything belongs to him. Why is it that we keep hiding it so well? Why is it that we don't give God everything? Because the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein, the cattle on a thousand hills, they all belong to God. Not only the cattle, but the people who keep the cattle belong to God. Not only the preachers and the people, but everybody belongs to God. And so Jesus leaves them with this idea, give Caesar his stuff, but you give God what belongs to God. People are trying to tie Jesus up. Then they get desperate. And they, they come to Jesus and say, we'll get him. And if you read the rest of this, the end of, of that passage, what it says is the Sadducees came to Jesus to talk to him about the resurrection. And you're sitting there saying, well, okay. You know, here's the problem with that. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. You ever have folk come to you trying to talk about Jesus? They just want to trip you up. They, 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 they don't want to see you living faithful. So they come to you and, oh, well, you know, if you believe this and what about that? Yeah. Oh, I'm, let me help you know. You know the person I'm talking about. They don't trust nobody got anything to do with a church. They don't trust the preacher. They don't trust the people who trust the preacher. They don't trust church folk at all. And they always got some antidote, some story, some preacher who failed on TV, and they want to bring it. See that? Well, I don't go to that church. I, I don't know what that preacher did. All of us sin. Sadducees come to Jesus to talk to him about the resurrection, not because they want to believe in him. They want to trip him up. So they say, well, you know, you believe in that resurrection thing, don't you, Jesus? Absolutely. I plan to get up. Uh, are you with me? Yeah, 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 yeah. They said, well, let us give you a hypothetical. You know how folk are. Let me give you a hypothetical. What if a woman's married to a man and he dies and she has no children? She marries another man, dies, has no children, marries another man and so forth and so on. When she gets to heaven in that resurrection you're talking about, whose wife will she be? All the brothers there. <laughs> Who, whose wife would she be? Jesus said, y'all got this thing twisted. Nobody gets married in heaven. No more husbands and wives. No more family reunions. No more. All of us in heaven get there and all we want to see is Jesus. Let, let me help you, because some of you are despondent right there. When you get there and you see your grandmother, after she gives you the quickest hug you ever had, she's going to turn and point. Your mama going to kiss you and... Your friends going to kiss you and... All eyes are going to turn toward the throne where the Lamb of God... We want stuff that God ain't interested in no more. Ain't nobody down here going to take no stuff up there. Everything down here stays here. We've got to make first things first. We've got to make God first in our lives. And then the best lawyer in the school said, you know, you've answered well, Rabbi. Yeah, you're sharp. But tell me, what's the greatest of the 613 commandments? And Jesus lifts up these things. And I, I want to preach for about 10 minutes on this thing that Jesus says. He says, you are to love the Lord your God with all of your soul. You ever been in a love relationship and you start sensing they don't love you like you love them? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but you know, stuff starts kind of, a little thrown off, right? 
You know, you used to put your hand out and they just went together. Huh? They don't talk no more. Just that. Hey. What? what? Huh? When I was, when I was, you know what they used to say, when I was out in the world, I used to go to the summit. Y'all going to have to tell all the young folk. That's, that's, what, that's what Lakewood used to be, the summit. And I would go to the confunction concert. Oh, yeah. Go to the com- huh? One night I went to the confunction, and there was a group there. Huh? And they were singing a song saying, if your heart ain't in it. Oh, is that it? Oh, if your heart ain't in it, my heart wasn't in it, I don't let it go. Oh, you don't remember that concert, you that? Look at you, look at you. Got your little big lighter just lit up. Oh, you, you with me now, huh? Everybody done woke up. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you something. If you want somebody to love you, really, what about loving God with all of your heart? What about loving God and not holding out on God? I mean loving God with your whole heart, everything that's there. I, I, I mean just loving God with, with everything. Now, every now and then, Yo, no, I can't sing, but my wife will act like I can. <laughs> Every now and then, I sing a little John Legend. All of me loves all of you. <laughs> oh, y'all don't hear me. I tell all your curves and all your edges. Oh, all your perfect imperfections. All of me. You ain't never loved nobody like that? Huh. I've been married almost 28 years. I like to reach over and just touch my wife. No, she did. That let me know I'm all right. <laughs> Come on here, somebody. When I travel and go out of town, I can't even sleep the first night. I'm now. I'm just tossing, turning, calling her on the phone. Baby, you all right? I'm just here looking at the walls. <laughs> I'm talking about when you're all in. I'm, I'm talking about when you love somebody. With all of yourself. See, God doesn't want us to just attend church. God doesn't want us to simply pay our tithes. God doesn't want us to join the choir usher, be a preacher. God wants you to love him with all of your heart. With all of your heart. Yeah, yeah. Your physical heart. Your emotional heart. The Bible says our emotions are seated in our heart. That's why Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 16, because I've said these things to you, your heart has become sorrowful. Everything is located in this thing we call a heart. And that heart can grow hard and callous. You remember, Pharaoh's heart got harder and harder and harder. Sometimes we've been hurt so much that the scar tissue is built up around our heart and it's atrophying inside of us and we don't believe we can love anybody or anything anymore because we've been hurt too much too often and so much of that hurt happens in the church. So many of those scars happen in the church when church folk will not love each other and care for each other and treat everybody the same and smile and love and embrace. We've been hurt by the people who should be the prime example of love. Listen, the heart can get bad. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Let me help you. Y'all just till I, I play some music, y'all just won't help me. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you. The things that we do start in the heart. Nobody accidentally cheats on their spouse. I don't care what the movies tell you, you out walking and the birds singing and they pass by and you don't know what overcome you. No, it starts 
in the heart with a thought, with, with an inclination, and you don't do anything to get your heart clean. You let that thing set up in your heart, and it begins to take some root in your heart. And then before long, it's squeezing out the love you should have for somebody else and replacing it with lust. Y'all ain't praying with me. Let, let, let me say, say, say it another way. This hard thing can get hard when we are always blaming somebody else and not looking at our own heart, our own situation, our own condition. You remember the medical center that we have in Houston is the largest medical center on the planet. They do amazing things. In the 60s, Dr. DeBakey and Cooley were able to go into a human body, take a heart out, put an artificial heart in. Are you with me? Kept working on that thing that they could take a beating heart out of a body, work on it, keep the body alive, fix it up, patch it up, and put it back in, sew you up and send you out. Are, are you with me? But long before Dr. Cooley and DeBacon started fixing hearts, we got a God that's a heart fixer. Yeah, my Bible tells me he gave Saul a new heart when he made him the king over the land of Israel. Ezekiel says that God will take out that hard heart and give you a soft heart, a heart made after God. Some of us need some heart transplanting. This thing we had won't work no more. We need God to go in and take that old thing out and give us a new God-shaped heart. Some of our hearts do all right as long as they're not under stress. L let me help the young people. Get insurance while you're young. When you get old, it's high. <laughs> when I was young and working and I was 20-something, you know, insurance was so cheap. <laughs> I'd be like, well, I'm going to pay for insurance. I'll never go to the doctor, right? I'll never, I ain't paying no insurance, man. I, I don't, uh, nothing hurt me. But now I know when I'm insurance, I got to look at that chart where the hell your age at. And every four years, they put you in a higher. Are you praying with me? They won't take your word. Now you got to go have somebody check your heart. Are you praying with me? How many of you have ever taken a stress test at the doctor? They put you on that treadmill. Oh, you know when you first get on the first, your brothers, you know, we get on that, we kind of cool. We first get on there, you know, we just kind of strolling through that thing. Then they start speeding that thing up, right? You know, you start sweating a little bit. <laughs> you start looking for the help. <laughs> oh, come on here, somebody. And some of you have had that uh, reclining stress test where they lay you down and put something in your arms and start speeding your heart up. Oh, it start off all right. You just land there. Okay, when they going to start this? You start feeling a little something. Then it's a little later on the other side of the window, you start looking at her like, hey, somebody monitoring this thing. <laughs> as long as we have money, our heart's all right. Yeah. As long as things are going our way and our families and our situations, then well, but the moment stress comes in. Let me show you a biblical example of that. My Bible says that Samson was a man stronger than anybody else on the planet. He had the spirit of God in him. But Delilah began to stress his life. Y'all ain't praying with me. My Bible says that he told her all of his heart. You know, when she first said, tell me, he lied. You know, guys will lie. Is that a surprise to anybody? First time Delilah asked him, he said, well, you know, get some ropes, tie me up. I'll be weak like any other man. They did. He just popped him and said, wait a minute, y'all got me wrong. Oh, yeah, put some chains on me. But when she said, baby, baby, baby. <laughs> Somebody over here know. <laughs> when she looked at him and said, baby, if you really love me, if you really love me, you wouldn't treat me like that. You tell me because you and I go together. Yeah, baby, come on, talk to me. He looked at that sister and said, baby, you cut my hair. <laughs> oh, he, the Bible says he told her all of his heart. 
because he was under stress. So many of us, we act one way on Sunday, but the truth be told, you don't know who we are until we're under stress, until we're pushed to the corner of life. My mother had heart surgery in August. The doctor uh, uh, came and to show me the images of a heart. He held them up and took his one. He said, you see this that goes over here and this, and this is where the blood, I wanted to look like I kind of knew. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to just say, I ain't got a clue. I don't know a left ventricle from a right ventricle. I don't know an aortic valve from a regular motor valve. I, I don't know. But he was pointing it out and said, your mother has a blockage here that's, that's keeping the chamber from pumping. And what I need to do is I need to bypass that so that the flow of blood will be able to get there. It will then pump the fluid out and it will alleviate some of the stress that her body is under. He was able to read the heart. Well, God is a heart reader. There's not a thought you have that God don't have up before the light looking at it. And God knows everything you need to have done in your life. But the doctor couldn't do it until I said, you have my permission. So I got my mama's medical power of attorney. Couldn't do it until I said, all right, doc, if that's the best thing, if that's what she has to have, give me the papers. Let me sign my name. Let me pray for my mama, kiss my mama, take her in the room, and I'm trusting that God will bring her out on the other side. Wait a minute. Until you let God take your heart out, until you let God take your heart and work on it and clean it up and turn it around, you can't really live a life. All right. All right, let me, let me come to an end. Every now and then, believers ought to have a little heartburn. You should have your heart burning on the inside of you. You'll remember the end of Luke's gospel. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, but there are two men walking on the Emmaus road, and they're walking and they're talking about what happened to Jesus. You know what they were saying. Wasn't it a shame? Oh, my God, look at what they did to him. Look at how they beat him and stripped him naked and crucified him. All he tried to do was do good. And while they were walking and they were confused about what their future was going to be, somebody walked up beside them and said, what are you guys talking about? And they looked at this person and said, where have you been? The whole world knows what happened to Jesus. He said, no, tell me more. And they just kept talking about it, and Jesus just listening. Jesus just, they come down to the beach, and Jesus gets some fish, and he begins to fry the fish. He takes the bread and breaks the bread, and when he gives it to them, their eyes are open because he gives it to them the way only Jesus can give it to them. He breaks it the whole way, only Jesus could. And then the text says, they looked at one another as this man disappeared and said, didn't our hearts burn on the inside? While he walked with us and talked with us, if you ain't got no heartburn, maybe you ain't walking and talking with him. Maybe you're not spending enough time with him. Listen, listen. Here's the literal. I'm going to give you this. Here is the literal translation from Greek to English. Whenever you translate from one language to the other and you translate, then you have to use our grammar Sometimes you miss the literal translation. Here's what the text says. CJ, put this up for me. When Jesus talks to them about loving God, this is what he says. And you shall love the God of you from all the heart of you. That's literally what he says. You shall love the God of you with all the heart of you. you you've got to first get this thing about who is the God of you. Is it your job, your 401k, your, your investments, your retirement, your house, your children, your spouse, your church, your history, your family, your circumstance? What's the God of you? What do you worship? Where do you bend down? Where do you bow your knee? Who do you call Lord of your life? Let the God of you with all the heart of you. 
with every part of yourself. Stop reserving these pieces for other folk. Well, I love God with this area. No, I love God with everything. And when you love God with all the heart of you, it'll change you. You won't be the same anymore. Whew. If I was going to be done by 1230, I got three minutes. You did hear the prepositional phrase, if. I just want to give you an example of what it means to give your heart to God. There's a man in the Bible we call Joseph, and I'm talking the boy who was sold by his brothers into slavery. Ain't nothing low down like your folk being low down. You ain't, ain't nobody in your family never been low down. You ain't got nobody in your family, nobody in the family trust. It is just me and you again. We don't. We the only one got folk. I got family members. You go to the house, they got locks on the bedroom door. Click, 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 click. Can't even trust other folk in the house. Your own brothers sell you into slavery. It could have hardened his heart. He could have said, I'll never trust anybody if I can't trust them. But he kept on trusting God. God raised him up out of the pit, brought him into Potiphar's house and put him in command. And they was doing good and temptation showed up. Don't you know it will? Now he could have said, well, you know, it ain't me, it's her. Huh? You, right? And, and you know what, what? But my heart isn't in this kind of living. My heart isn't in this kind of life. You don't have to do wrong because folk give you wrong to do. You've got to make a decision to live. And let me tell you something. Sometimes when you make a decision to live for God, you'll still end up incarcerated. He says, I'm not going to do wrong, but she told the story in a different way, and they put him in jail. Surely his heart was going to be hard then. Surely he was going to be angry and never go. But he was just there when there was an opportunity to tell a dream. He said, tell him this is what. And then they left him and forgot to even tell the man. But he just kept on being faithful to God. And God raised him out of a prison and put him in Pharaoh's palace. And you remember those brothers? The ones who had sold him in slavery? Now he's a grown man dressed in the best of the Egyptian monarchy, and they all show up in front of him, and he knows them all. He said, that's my big brother, Simeon. He's the one that held me down. Yeah, yeah, and that's Ishakar. Yeah, yeah, he tied me down. Zebulon, none of them stood up for me. None of them stood up for me. He says, but now I got him. Oh, you ever had somebody you really wanted to get? Oh, they treated you wrong, but now they got to come to you. Yeah, they wouldn't speak to you, but now they need to borrow something from me. Oh, they wouldn't treat me right, but I got them just where I want them. Oh, I wish you had an opportunity to read the book of Genesis. He says, I want you to come to dinner with me. He set them down at the table, and he set them down by rank order. He set them down from the oldest to the youngest. They start looking, how would he know? So where your dad at? Oh, he's an old man now. He's an old man now, and he's at home. He said, give me that youngest boy, leave him here. He said, but it'll break my daddy's heart. He says, you got to go and get Listen, life is not fair, but if you love God with your whole heart, it won't be the circumstance that makes you live. What You're going to live for God no matter what's going on in your life. Sisters and brothers, in this church, if we're not going to love the God of us all with the heart of us all, we're just wasting God's time. But if you've made up your mind that you want a new heart, a heart that follows God and serves God, come and give your life to him. You don't have to join this church, but if you've been keeping a part of this away from God, if you haven't been bringing him all of your hurt, all of your pain, why don't you do that today? Give your life to him today. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. If you're looking for a church home, come and join us. Yeah, we got some real problems. That's because we in here. We're all broken. We're all sinners. But we're working on living for Jesus. You need to stop worrying about whether or not we Methodist or Baptist, Pentecostal, this, that, and the other. Listen, you stay here long enough, you'll get a praise break. Just come on and worship God. Come on and worship God. Give God your best. Give him your heart. Jesus said to that young man, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And he said to Jesus, yeah, yeah, that's good. Then Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom. Until we start loving our neighbors, it's not going to matter what we say about Jesus. Will you stand with me? And while you're here today, if you don't know him, this isn't an invitation to join this church. This is just an invitation to give your life to him. Will you come forward? If you've been visiting, maybe this is your first time with us. Will you come today? Join us. Help us be the community that loves God with all of our soul. Will you come today? More? Love you more than anything. Yes, Lord. Come, my sisters and my brothers, will you come today? Tell him the truth that you love him more. And the only way to do that is give your life to him. Don't hold yourself from him. You can give money, you can give time, but he wants you. for you, Lord. I want to pray for you. I want to give for you. I want to be here for you, Lord. I want to witness for you, Lord. I want the world to know what you've done for me, Lord. I worship and adore you.